Number 889. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by A Game of Thrones Enhanced Editions, uh, which are available on iBooks. And they're amazing. You, I have read Game of Thrones, and I read it like a couple years ago, so I have a real book. And I constantly was having to take out my phone or go to my computer and look up, who is this person? Why are they important? How do they connect? Yeah. What family are they in? Or what's, what's their happening? sigil? Like, who are yeah. these people? And so, like, at the beginning of every chapter, it, it shows you a map of where the character is. It gives you a little, like reminder of what's happening where they were last time we saw them and then like if someone's name pops up it'll be bold and you can click on it'll say this person is so and so and it describes who they are how you know them you get these little footnotes and it will remind you of like why whatever is happening is important or Uh why it's happening or rumors that might prelude to what's going to happen and stuff like that it's so convenient that's excellent (laughs) so it's an enhanced book yeah basically which is available exclusively on ibooks so if you go to apple.co slash Game of Thrones, you can check that out. Whether or not you've read Game of Thrones, or even if you have, and you just want a more interactive, informational yeah. experience, so you you don't feel your brain trying yeah. to twist itself in half. And the maps are beautiful, and then they have really great uh, artwork, too. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you to George R. R. Martin for making Game of Thrones. Uh, thank you to George R. R. Martin also for the uh, Game of Thrones Enhanced Editions, making Game of Thrones easier for the audience. <laughs> uh, there it is. It's available at apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Uh, not available in all countries. That's something I should say. So hopefully it is available in your country. Um, what is on the uh, Nerdist Community Court Board? I got a couple of cool things. Is this so, uh, events at Nerdist.com? Yes, or on the uh, on the Reddit. Subreddit. The subreddit yeah, yeah, Nerdist subreddit. So Cassidy writes, I'm an intern with the Einstein Project, which is a non-pro- non-profit based out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. They work with schools and educators throughout Wisconsin to provide quality interactive STEM education for students. And uh, they are partnering with the Greater Green Bay STEM Network to host an event August 10th through 11th, noon to noon. It's a 24-hour event. It's called 24-Hour Tech Tank at Initiative One in downtown Green Bay. They're going to have developers, marketers, designers, other tech professionals all in the same room to develop a website and app for the Greater Green Bay STEM Network. There's going to be food, door prizes, activities, and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to find out more info about attending or if you want to volunteer to help out, which they she mentioned they need volunteers, uh, you can search Greater Green Bay STEM Network on Facebook to find out more info. And then also Dan Linterson writes, I'm a painter whose work you may have seen at Gallery 1988, which I go to, uh, Think Space Gallery or various other venues around the country. My paintings take a darkly funny view of contemporary society, often influenced by pop culture. You can see them here at danlinderson.com. And he's going to have a solo exhibition of new paintings opening next month at Jack Fisher Gallery in San Francisco. The show will be open from August 5th to September 30th. And there's going to be a reception on August 5th. So uh, check it out at Jack Fisher Gallery in San Francisco. Excellent. Thank you so much for the Nerdist Community Corkboard from folks like you. Uh, this episode is Al Gore, who yes. um, Al has a uh, Al. <laughs> Are we on a first name basis now, really? Uh, Mr. Gore has. Uh, well, I'll say Al. Al's promoting uh, an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, which is in theaters in LA and New York now, opening wide Friday, August fourth. Tickets and info can be found at inconveniencesequel.com. I saw it. It's great. Now, I this was uh, we've never really had on. Uh, I don't, I don't think we've had a politician we on have before. Not. I think this is the first. Uh, yeah, and so it, for me, r- rather than getting into the nuts and bolts of like, let's bash one side of politics and not another side, and let's all, I was so f- interested to hear about the process of how government works. Yeah, and how it's changed, and how and how it's changed, and sort of trying to unpack sort of the human side. I mean, like government is. You know, I think some people look at government and they go, well, it's just this sort of like faceless body that, you know, makes decisions yeah. based on however it makes decisions. And 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 I and I think it's made up of humans. <laughs> and I'm interested to hear how these humans interact and how they react and how do they, you know. So we actually we actually talked a lot about that stuff. So he was really nice and really en- so cool. and really engaging cool. and and uh, and it was a fun it was a fun podcast. Yeah, he was so, funny. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes I get nervous because I think, you know, if people to have different types of people on the show, you sort of get in your comfort zone. You're like, no, I know how to talk to actors. I know how to talk to comedians. I can talk to directors. I can talk to musicians. But it was 
it was fun for me to sort of step outside a little bit and uh, and have a different kind of a conversation. And that's all these are just conversations. Yeah, it's like what's human about this person yeah. and how do they how do they interact and uh, and so uh, and and it was interesting to do it. We did it at the Four Seasons where the, his press junket was happening, and you could see downtown Los Angeles, and there was just like this <sighs> plume of I know. <laughs> this plume of gunk just like a hovering, you know, that just cuts out the middle of the buildings. Terrible uh, smog haze all the time. I know. But then, you know, like I said in the podcast, like, I'm, you know, I complain about that, and I'm 100% part of the problem. I don't yeah. have an electric car. My house is not uh, solar-powered. I mean, you know, I am I am part of the problem. So some of it was, you know, what can I do yeah. as a citizen who j- doesn't, you know, who says, like, I want change. Well, I need to I need to be a part of that change. I can't just complain and shake my fists. Like, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna bitch about stuff, I need to, what can I, what can people like me do if we're interested? Yeah. And he talks about that here, and he talks about that in the movie. But it's also just so. about finding information. Like, yes. no matter what you believe or no matter what you think you believe just make sure that you're you know that you're sourcing information you know just like fi- s- seek out information yeah don't just read headlines yes That's what <laughs> um but uh yes yeah, so this episode Al gore uh also stamps.com sponsoring the nerdist podcast they've been really sponsoring us for uh Forever. they've been such a great supporter so of this podcast they really are and so that is why we are loyal about telling you to not go to the post office anymore you don't need to do it Print and buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Sick, you click print and then you, you mail it and you're done. It's so easy. It is easy. It's way easier than going to the post office. Which closes. Traffic, having the park, getting out, and then, and then everyone, no one seems to, uh, like, you know... I feel like every time I go to the post office, people are like, have never mailed anything. They've never before. been to a post office. Someone came up to April Richardson once. Like she said, this this teenage girl came up to her and was like, uh, "How do I mail a letter?" And April was like, "What?" Oh. She was like, do, "Do I put this in a put this yeah. somewhere?" And April was like, "You have to put a stamp on it, and then you have to put it in that blue box over there." So just stay at home. Where so, it's easier. Yeah, just your own yeah, exactly. So just don't even don't even bother with all that stuff. <laughs> don't learn how the post office works. Just print stuff out in your home. Right now, you can enjoy Stamps.com with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That's Stamps.com. Enter the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Here's Nerdist Podcast number 889 with Al Gore. Katie, roll the thing. Now entering NERDIST.com. So this, uh, I know you're doing a million of things today, but this is basically just a very uh, sort of loose, casual conversation. I know what the Nerdist is. Okay, all right, all right, okay. I didn't know. I wasn't I sure. Just because <laughs> <Just 'cause> I'm old? <laughs> with it? I assume you're busy, you know, like trying to fix the climate and stuff. So well, I didn't can you know. do that without being a Nerdist? <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be your microphone right there. How is your day so far today? Great, thank you. Good. It's kind of, uh, it's almost ironic that we're looking out the window and you can see like hazy downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> You're like, just like a light, you know. How is Los Angeles in terms of pollution index? Are we, are we in the top 10 or the top? We have to be at least in the top 20. Well, Los Angeles has uh, unique challenges and has historically, and Los Angeles actually has come a long way. Uh, recently, there there was a, a reversion uh, on some of the levels, but you know California is a, a, a global leader now. And just last week, uh, Jerry Brown passed this historic legislation. Uh, he has really been a fantastic governor and a leader on the climate issue, partnering with other regional governments and cities around the world. And yeah. I was in Australia two weeks ago. And delivered letters from uh, Governor Brown to the premiers of the four largest uh, states in Australia. They they have the same kind of deal there, where they uh, actually have the levers of power on a lot of these things, and a, and a federal government that's uh, not on side. 
Uh, so in, anyway, Los Angeles uh, is is uh, is making some progress. Well, that's good. That's good to hear because it feels like you know I I live in East Hollywood and it probably took me. I, we were, I was telling Katie, our producer, and Debbie, our, our booker, that uh, every year it just feels like more and more cars, more and more people, yeah. more and more construction. Uh, and it, it, it feels like we're on the precipice of some type of an apocalypse here in California. But, but I guess if it's getting better, that's good to hear. Well, the, the electric cars are poised to take a much larger share of sure. the market soon. Uh, and the U.S. now gets more global warming pollution and conventional pollution from transportation than from uh, the generation of electric power. So the next frontier for the U.S. is really accelerating the the shift over to electric vehicles powered by renewable electricity. Right. I mean, I feel I, I, I must cop to the fact that I and I assume this is most people, but I, I, I'm a complete hypocrite because I am one of these people who says we need to do something about the environment. We need to do something for the climate. And yet I don't own an electric car. You know, my house isn't solar powered. Well, they haven't. Uh, electric cars haven't really been in the price range uh, uh, to to make them affordable for a whole lot of people until now, right? Uh, and uh, hybrids ha- have have been in that range, but now the shift to electric vehicles is going to be massive. India just announced a couple months ago, th- astonishingly, that by, in, within 13 years, 100 percent of all their new cars and drugs are going to have to be electric. Oh wow! Isn't that incredible? That is incredible, especially after what I saw in the in the sequel in the documentary last night. Yeah, about yeah. What's going on? With <laughs> well, Solar they've City. done a. A big U-turn just since the Paris Agreement. Uh, they're shutting hundreds of coal burning plants and massively expanding solar. Um, Volvo, by the way, just announced it's not going to. It's going to stop making uh, internal combustion oh, wow. engine-based uh, vehicles uh, by the 2019 model year, which is right. basically the end of next year. So um, every major manufacturer in the world, auto manufacturer, is introducing uh, electric vehicles and the new tesla model 3 i guess it is mm-hmm. is the consumer affordable uh, model is coming out imminently so uh there there are answers to the dilemma you've been facing and where solar panels are concerned yeah there are now companies in california who will make you the following deal uh they'll say we will put solar panels all over your roof tomorrow and the next day your bills will drop 20 percent for electricity how much will it cost you nothing really yeah what what's a pretty good what's what's incentivizing these companies to do that they make the the savings are large enough that they can make a profit even as your bills go down oh wow now part of it is uh, because of the incentives sure but it's worth remembering that the subsidies for fossil fuels are 40 times larger than the subsidies for renewables. But now a lot of these uh, companies, uh, and uh, Tesla, by, by the way, is one of them. Uh, Solar City was absorbed by uh, Tesla. They're probably the leading company here, but there are several others who will make you that deal. That's great. And I know that... Uh Elon, who's uh, you know the basically a modern day Tony Stark, a uh, real world Tony Stark. He, um, he, I was seeing that the ceiling, the ceiling tiles that he was making that yeah. were that were solar tiles. But I think a lot of it is is just hoping that the efficiency catches up. It's like if there are more charging stations around and those charging stations could charge faster and more efficiently, I think it'll start to tip more, yeah. you know, rather than, I mean, an electric car is fine if you, if you travel in the same radius, but if you have to go a long distance, I know I was just a comic con and a guy down there had a Tesla and he was like, I'm really nervous about getting home. <laughs> Cause I don't know, you know, he was at a hotel and he think he thought he had just enough to get home, but was really concerned. Cause there wasn't really, a lot of places for him to stop on the way. Yeah, they call that range anxiety. But <laughs> but uh, I just got one. Actually, uh, this sounds like an extended commercial, and it's not intended that way. But but um, I, I just got one last month, and they will tell you right on the dash where the recharging stations are, mm-hmm. uh, how long it'll take to recharge, and you can plan out your trip. There's basically nowhere you can't go and make it. Okay. Uh, so anyway. I want to. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to. I want to. We got to get the Tennessee part of this into the conversation because I'm from Memphis. Oh yeah, that's right. They told me that. Yeah, I grew up in Memphis. Um, I moved there when I was probably in. Th- my parents moved there when I was in third grade, 
and then I moved away, you know, my mom and I moved away in high school. My dad, you know, lived in Memphis until he passed away. But Tennessee is a such a lovely state. Mm. Uh, are you Nashville based? Yeah, you are Nashville based. Yeah, and my farm is uh, fifty miles east of Nashville. Oh, that's good. Nashville is such a great town. Oh my, thank you very much. It's a it's a hot city. I'm telling you, it's really uh, it, it it it's getting a lot of good ink these days, and deservedly so. Well, it's you know uh, it, it, you have a university there, and wherever there's a big uni- state university. You have a lot of culture. You have a, you you had the music culture that was already there. Yeah, and the food and the people. Yeah, and- it's a foodie city, and actually a lot of universities. That, that's it was named a uh, hundred years ago the Athens of the South because of all the universities there. Vanderbilt is sort of the star of that uh, of that group, but there are a bunch of others as well. A- and uh, the the culture is incredible. It's the uh, songwriting capital of the world and one of the three biggest uh, music recording uh, cities in the world, uh, New York and L.A. Uh, being the, the other two. And uh, the, the number of artists and also actors uh, mm-hmm. uh, who have moved to Nashville, uh, r- really, it's, uh, it's an amazing scene there now. And I, I, I'm, this is against my interest because most of us uh, who, who live there are, are you, you know n- not not really wanting to encourage faster <laughs> growth, but it's a it's a cool it's a great city, really. It is. Is, it, she said the, is that why there's a Parthenon there? What, yeah, why yeah. Is there a Parthenon yeah, in the absolutely. Of and I remember, oh, decades ago when they installed the uh, uh, the the pagan statue of Minerva in the uh, Parthenon, <laughs> some of the fundamentalist uh, preachers were. Uh, I'm pretty upset. Uh, most of them were fine with it because they understood the whole thing, but a few of them really got upset. <laughs> but the Parthenon is really cool. Absolutely. It is really cool. I mean, you're just driving around and it's like, oh, here's a little, there's like a Starbucks right there and you look across you from the Starbucks and there's just a Parthenon in the middle <laughs> of a park. Uh, but it's, it's just such a lovely city for culture and Tennessee is I, I have nothing but good feelings about the state of Tennessee. Do you uh, ever, I mean, you must travel nonstop with what you're doing. I travel probably a little too much because I give my slideshow um, all around the country, all around the world, and I, I, I spend a lot of time training climate activists, mm-hmm. and, and uh, that 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 leads me to travel more than I should. Yeah, right. I want to ask about because I don't I don't want to talk about politics per se, but I'm interested in sort of the human side of politics because I think when we see you know, what we see in the news, what we see in the headlines, or we see, you know, just footage of people in Congress sort of, you know, wagging fingers at each other. I think we think of it as very one dimensional mm. in, in terms of this, you know, I agree with this person. So that person is good and that person is bad. Yeah. But obviously there's a human element to it. Yeah. So first of all, what made you want to go into politics? Because to me, it just feels like, it's so messy, and how can you ever uncover what's true, and how can you retain what you believe in while compromising with other people? It just, it just feels yeah. like such a disastrous mess. <laughs> well, um, first of all, my story is uh, a little uh, atypical in that I was born into a Your father, yes. family. My dad had been in the Congress for 10 years <laughs> before I was born and uh, left the Senate, uh, was defeated in his last election because he was an early opponent of the Vietnam War in the Volunteer State, which right. is Tennessee's nickname. Uh, I was very proud of him. But I saw it all my life. And then in the mid-'70s, I was elected to the House. Uh, and I've watched it uh, from different points of view all my life. And in answer to your question, uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, I wanted to do what my dad did when I was a kid, but when I saw the presidency of Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War based on a lie at the talk, with the Tonkin Gulf uh, resolution, and then Nixon followed to that, and I just thought, man, that's the last thing I'll ever do. And I, became, I went to Vietnam. I came back, and uh, I worked as a journalist for five years, and thought that's what I would be for the rest of my life. But I started covering government, and it kind of reawakened some of those uh, uh, young uh, childhood thoughts. Uh, uh, I began to think uh, that m- maybe I could do this a little bit better than some of the people I'm covering. And <laughs> anyway, I jumped into a race for Congress. 
And the main point I want to make is that when I started doing these town hall meetings, I, I called them open meetings, uh, and then went back to the, uh, the Capitol in D.C., um, honest to goodness, it was so thrilling. This sounds a little corny, but I could almost hear the battle hymn of the Republic being hummed in the background. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I promise you, it was really uh, an amazing experience, and I loved it. And our founders uh, designed a system that takes into account all those contradictions that you referred to in setting up your question. They knew these tensions would exist. And, it, you, you know, it's not a problem to be solved. It's a dilemma to be managed. And if you have really strong feelings about something and the majority of your constituents disagree, you have a chance to explain yourself and collect information from them, take it back to D.C., then go back and tell them what's going on in the, uh, you know, in the committee meetings and on the floor of the Congress. And I did that. And it, and it was, as I said, th thrilling. Later on, when television became dominant and the 30-second TV ads caused all the candidates to spend all their money, all their time, begging rich people and special interests for money, it really did begin to change. So the way those natural and healthy tensions are reconciled today is very different. Uh, and it's not good. Uh, our democracy has been hacked. And I don't mean by the Russians. That happened too. But uh, hacked by big money uh, before Putin got a hold of the system. Um, and now they will invite lobbyists to actually write the, the, the bills and let them really make the essential decisions on governing, which is disgusting. And it's a, a betrayal of what our founders intended. In spite of that, I see this process of change continuing. And just as television displaced uh, newsprint and installed gatekeepers that could charge heavy rents for access to the public mind, now the Internet-based uh, media and uh, you are a prime example of this uh, phenomena, uh, not to uh, in, indulge in idle flattery, but <laughs> I'll take uh, it. it really and truly, uh, now you, you don't have a gatekeeper that you have to pay a ton of money no. to. Uh, and when people uh, connect with the thinking process of someone who's really taken time to collect information, process it, apply their values and share it with others, that's the, that's the basic mechanism at the heart of the Constitution. And it's coming back now. And yes, the Internet has all these horrible problems and echo chambers and all the rest. But there's some self-correcting mechanisms, and we're beginning to see the evolution of it. The first decades of the printing press were pretty dang messy uh, also. And you saw in the Bernie Sanders campaign, whether you agreed with his agenda or not, just in terms of the fundamentals, he proved that it's now possible to run an effective campaign and potentially a winning campaign without having any special interest money, without having the lobbyists write the position papers, without relying uh, on big fat cat donors, but just going out on the Internet and asking for small contributions from people who agree with the direction you're proposing. That's exciting to me. And it brings back that feeling that I had in the mid-70s when I was able to get elected to Congress without having a single uh, fundraiser, without relying on any special interest contributions, we can get back to the way American democracy is supposed to work. When you were incentivizing um, Internet growth early on, mm -hmm. did it become <laughs> what you thought it would? Was it way beyond what you imagined? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, did you think, oh, this will just be some, you know, inform it'll be like a, like a large public library where people just be able to freely share some information. I mean, did you have any inkling of how much it would become the matrix, essentially? Well, uh, a lot of what has developed was uh, something that could be anticipated. And I had the privilege of working with the scientists and engineers who were there in the earliest days and... Uh, it, it was possible to envision much of what uh, has unfolded, but uh, there have also been um, developments that I did certainly did not anticipate and do not welcome. We have a, uh, 
a, a stalker economy now where people are tracking your clicks and compiling, uh, I don't know if you want to call them dossiers, but they have huge compilations of information about everybody. And, and before you even get to the intelligence services and security agencies, the advertiser-supported uh, uh, Internet companies have in, an incentive to collect a lot of data about everybody. Sure. And I don't think that's very healthy. I, I saw a story yesterday, uh, and this is maybe a tangent, but it illustrates Please. the point. Um, you know this uh, company Roomba? Of course, yeah. Yeah, the I saw the story. <laughs> robotic uh, <laughs> vacuum cleaners that go around and uh, c- clean your floors while you're at work. And now the, the story you saw also, they're proposing to sell a roadmap of your house, <laughs> you know, a floor plan of your house to uh, some of the other companies. And I'm thinking, wow, that would, if I had a Roomba, that would cause me to get rid of my <laughs> Roomba. I mean, seriously. I mean, by what right? I mean, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's so invasive now. Uh, and, um, you know, you've had the experience, I'm sure some people have, of using some word uh, in an email, and all of a sudden you start getting ads for what Oh, yeah, whatever have. that thing is. Well, that's just, that's just uh, I mean, I could, you know, when that first started years ago, it seemed benign. But now when you, when you add it to all of the other information, I, I, I just think that we need to, <laughs> to, to really be, be careful on that stuff and have some restrictions on it. And, and, and by the way, I think it's really important to defend the principle of net neutrality. I, a hundred, of course it is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, the Internet is, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't say it's air, but it's, it's, it's something that's so integral to the way that people yeah. need to exist now yeah. and to, to tear it and to throttle certain people if they're not paying enough money is, uh, is, is rotten. I mean, and, and we are... It's almost like consumerism is 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 leading us, and we're welcoming this age of like techno fascism almost in a way where yeah. we're just allowing. And in some cases, you go, okay, I guess it's fine. You know, I I do like this one product, so when it gets offered to me, okay, great, I like that. But just the the farther reaching implications about becoming too reliant on this yeah. to exist is really is is kind of scary. And now now they have this uh, new development called ambient computing, which basically. You know, like Amazon's Echo, and there, right. there are others uh, where it's always listening, <laughs> yeah, and like you know you're supposed to trust the fact that it's only gonna. You saw the story about the kid who bought a doll on her parents' uh, yeah. Amazon, and the parents were furious, and it got into the uh, news, and a, a TV newscaster broadcast uh, the the story and repeated the little girl's uh, command. Uh, and hundreds of homes bought the same doll because, <laughs> yeah. because the, <laughs> the microphone picked up the order while the TV was on. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, it's a brave new world for sure. It is, and we really kind of have to figure out how to how to manage it responsibly, and and especially, you know, it. Because I, I mean, I like that our culture has become a niche culture in the sense that the that the internet has really created a lot of communities that were very difficult to find in a pre-internet era. Everyone can find yeah. a community now, but of course, the downside to that is that the, the people are less willing to form larger, you know, communities for sort yeah. of a greater good. It's like, no, I have my tiny little community over here. I don't care what's going on over over there. Uh, by the way, um, assuming. Since your audience has grown so much that there are uh, a lot of homes with uh, these ambient microphones, yes. I- I'd just like to say, Alexa, <laughs> go to inconveniencesequel.com Nicely done. and buy advance tickets uh, to an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, which <laughs> opens in Los Angeles and New York City. On Friday, July 28th, and in cities all across America, August 4th. Thank you, Alexa. That was very, that was very well done. That was very well slid in. And I think people aren't even going to notice that, that uh, it's just going to... All of a sudden, they're going to go, where'd these tickets come from? <laughs> what am I doing at the theater? Somehow, the Alexa's gotten them to the theater, <laughs> sat them down. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, when I watch 
things that are going on uh, politically, like like most people, I do the thing where I go, why can't they just dot dot dot? Yeah. It, everyone oversimplifies the process. Is there anything you can share that? People may not understand about how the process works because nothing is as simple what as process is that? any process, uh, enacting bills, enacting laws, oh, okay. making change in government. Because, you know, when you I, I know when when anyone enters politics, I'm sure most people's ag- agenda is I want to do good things. Yeah. Then you get into it. You find out it's not so easy to do exactly what you want yeah. when you want it. So what is something that you could share with people so that they could understand a little bit better? how this process works so that they understand yeah. that it's not as simple as just do A and get B result. Yeah, it's uh, – of course, our Constitution was uh, constructed in reaction to the perceived abuses of uh, King George back in the day. Right. And so they made it uh, intentionally difficult to enact new laws. Uh, and uh, the kinds of laws that uh, inspired passions uh, – uh, in the late 18th century, taxes in particular, uh, the initiative has to be taken by the House of Representatives, which is on a two-year re-election leash mm-hmm. and therefore, in theory, much more responsive to the electorate. So um, uh, it, it, it's intended to be difficult. Now, here, here's the thing. You, as a citizen, have a, a, a member of the House of Representatives... Uh, who uh, is responsive to you. You have two senators, whatever state you live in. Mm -hmm. You have a president that is the only one that represents the whole country. And let's just keep it at the federal level, but the same essential dynamics operate for state government and for local government, city government, county government, et cetera, just at the federal level. Okay, so it is more difficult nowadays for you as an individual citizen to get your member of Congress to be responsive to you because they are more attuned now to the sources of their campaign contributions. Got it. Okay? So that's a a problem. Sure. But it is not an insurmountable barrier. The old cliche, there's strength in numbers, still applies. And if you can go out on social media and collect a number of other people who agree with you, and then you can go to your member of Congress, you can knock on the the district office door. That person, the member of Congress, he, and she, he or she's probably not going to be there, but they'll have people who are, who are trained to, to recognize uh, passions <laughs> that start to, to of start to bubble up. If they have town hall meetings, you can go and, and take some other people with you go to the indivisible uh, organization they've got this really down they're they're really good at that indivisibleguide.com i think is their their site um and, and so here is the message you deliver if you for example you want to solve the climate crisis right you deliver a two-part message part number one i and all my friends want you to to support solutions to the climate crisis we're tired of uh, people uh, responding only to the carbon polluters. If you do the right thing, we are prepared to work for you and help you get reelected and campaign for you and, and tell our friends on our social networks that w- we're really for you. Part two of your message. If you are not on side, if you're for the carbon polluters instead of the public interest, I guarantee you we will not rest until we defeat you and kick you out of office. So choose door number one or door number two. (laughs) Now, if enough people deliver that message with passion and conviction and back it up with their physical presence at a town hall meeting or a district office and handmade signs and really convince that person that you are deadly serious about this, you can clear the bar that makes them think, uh, mm, maybe I can't go with the carbon polluters on this one. Maybe I'm going to get defeated if I do. It works. I've seen it work. Well, that's good to hear because I think that 
you know, most people today are a part of uh, <laughs> hashtag activism where they just feel like, oh, I tweeted out a thing. I was angry in a moment and I tweeted out a thing and that was my political activism. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You got you, th- that idea of, you know, showing up in real life is really, I think most people don't, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, there was a famous phrase, uh, weak ties that, uh, uh, describes the, the, the phenomenon you're talking about. If you just check a box on the internet, if you just click, um, it, it's not meaningless. It, 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 it makes some difference, but not much of, of a difference. If, on the other hand, you actually show up in person, that that does make a difference. And, you know, it's interesting that so many businesses now use this phrase, clicks and bricks, Mm -hmm. where they will use the Internet to to distribute information and get people into a store, get people to a physical location, but then they're prepared for them when they show up in person. That uh, hybrid of clicks and bricks works in politics as well. You can use, as Indivisible does, as the Climate Reality Project does, you can use the Internet to inform people, to tell them where the meetups are, where the meeting is. But there's something about face-to-face interaction where groups get together, make decisions collectively, and then take action together. That is that that that's the king in politics. That's the dominant force in politics. The internet, uh, the networks, and social media can empower that and magnify it, but it has to involve a a physical presence. There's an old African saying: when you pray, move your feet. Uh, w- when you want something to happen in our country, uh, find to click, but follow it up by moving your feet and going with your physical body <laughs> and putting it on the line saying, okay, I'm here. I'm serious. I mean it. Uh, how the, the, a, a politician must have to develop such a thick skin mm. to be a politician because almost every time you open your mouth, a percentage of people are going to go, yay. And a percentage of people are going to call you horrible names. Yeah. And so, and especially now with social media, that's much more apparent than it, you know, it was even when you were vice president, you know, yep. you, you see more, but so, I mean, how, how do you – and I guess this is just good advice for anyone, but how do you stay on, uh, stay on point, take your emotion out of it, and try not to personalize and just recognize like, well, you know, everyone's passionate. So maybe that's, maybe that's just the way they express that passion in a very negative and broken way. How do you get around that? Yeah, well, there's, it's worth remembering uh, that it's a time-honored truth that uh, when someone or a group or some company – uh, hates a particular message, they are tempted to lash out and attack the messenger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't take it personally. I've been uh, trying to uh, catalyze solutions to the climate crisis for 40 years now. And um, I've, I've seen it. Uh, I've been there. I've experienced it. Uh, and yeah, you do get a thick skin just because it's human nature when you go through this kind of thing. You, you kind of develop... Uh, an, an immunity of sorts, and uh, when when it, when it does get to you, you can easily pretend that it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it, basically. Well, yeah. I mean, if you believe in what you're doing, I mean, the whole thing is about uh, leg- authentic passion for for what you believe in, and all of us have the ability to 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 feel what's more likely to be true than not. Uh, and if you take time to gather the best available evidence and uh, engage in discourse with others to sort of refine your thinking about it, um, knowledge is power. Uh, and, and, and then you're willing to to really put yourself out there and express it passionately and forcefully, then you, you can really ma- make make a difference. Yeah, but, you know, to even survive a presidential campaign to me seems... I don't even know how some you know, because people, especially just pulling out everything and trying to spin everything as yeah. negatively against opponents as possible. And I, you know, I'm sure there are things that come out. And you go, well, the, you know, hey, I really wish I had time to explain this. Did not happen that way, or yeah, this yeah. is not. You're lacking a context, and that's a headline. But I guess you really have to figure out how to somehow just push all that out of the, out of the way. Yeah, and it, and and again, to put it in context. It's often uh, illuminating to go back and read about the 
uh, presidential election of 1800 <laughs> or some of the some of the earliest uh, political contests when America was was young boy some of the personal attacks and some of the <laughs> out, outrageous campaigns against individuals back then yeah, exceed anything in today's uh, politics and you know there were people shot on the floor of the of congress course, right. beaten senseless with canes and you know it's uh, it uh, there was a senator there was a blind senator from Oklahoma named Gore uh, he was actually the grandfather of Gore Vidal, and he, okay. he was a blind senator. I'll just tell you this quick story because it popped into my mind. He, uh, though he was blind, he was a, a very skillful orator. And the story goes that one of his uh, defeated opponents mumbled it on the Senate floor. If it were not for the senator's disability, I would challenge him to a contest of a different kind. To which Senator Gore replied, blindfold that son of a bitch and point him in my direction. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on now is uh, uh, a manifestation of human nature, which hasn't changed in two and a quarter centuries, at least. Do you think we're doing a do you think we are doing what the our forefathers, uh, the founding fathers would have thought we should be doing? Because sometimes I'll see like. You know, things are going on. I go, I don't know if that's what Jefferson had in mind. You know, like I'm not 100 percent sure that we are following, you know, what they what they hoped for our future. Do you think we're in line with what they saw or do you think, you know, we should really take a take a minute and reexamine? Oh, yeah, I think we should reexamine for sure. We we've strayed far from their design. But again, to put it in context, there have been other periods uh, the robber baron. Uh, era right. maybe maybe not quite as bad as now, but at least close. There have been other periods when uh, wealthy, powerful fat cats uh, were able to to pull the strings and punch the, and pull the levers and make things happen for them instead of for the public. Uh, and th- that part's not new. It's worse now, in in my opinion. And I think this in in, in the previous periods. They have been followed by waves of reform. Right. Uh, the, the populist movement that Teddy Roosevelt took and enacted all these reforms and antitrust laws and uh, all the rest, that was a healing uh, period for our country. Uh, a- and when the abuses have gotten out of hand, uh, they've, they've often been followed by reforms. We're overdue for a reform movement. But, you know, there's a law of physics that sometimes operates in politics, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Of course. Uh, and the reaction to the excesses and absurdities of Donald Trump is quite impressive now. Uh, we're now seeing a, an upsurge of progressive uh, activism on lots of issues, not least among them climate, that's really un- unprecedented. Uh, the indivisible movement I mentioned earlier is working with uh, the Climate Reality Project and uh, uh, paramount uh, with and participant with the release of uh, this movie this weekend and o- over the next uh, few weeks uh, to 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 mobilize people who are, have really had it up to here with what Donald Trump and his rogue gallery of climate deniers are, are doing uh, and I, I'm optimistic that this may be the beginning of one of those reform periods. And so it, it, just for people who maybe don't understand the full scope of everything that's going on, so it, removing ourselves from the Paris Agreement, <clears throat> which is, you know, it, which is a large arc. I mean, it's, it actually doesn't come in until the end, but a large arc of the sequel is about the Paris Agreement yeah. in 2016. Um, so what uh, – does this mean that America is, is not – doing anything to reduce carbon emissions or is it is it now on each citizen to do their part to pick up where the government's not putting money into that anymore well it's uh everybody can make a difference for sure and you you start by learning about it uh I, i hope people will go see this movie because it will tell them what they need to know about the crisis about the solutions and about what they can do individually there is a book being published tomorrow uh, 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 with the same uh, title, in, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. It is partly a, a guidebook for how you can be an activist. But it also, again, tells you everything you need to know about the problem and everything you need to know about the solutions. 
But it's not only down to individuals because we have a lot of governors and mayors and business leaders who are stepping up, filling the gap. They have said in large numbers, we are still in the Paris Agreement. Uh, We're going to meet the commitments made uh, by former President Obama, regardless of what Donald Trump does. California, I mentioned, just passed this historic legislation last week. Jerry Brown came from Sacramento for the red carpet premiere Tuesday night of the movie here in L.A. He's been a a real hero. Um, And it's not only Democrats. He had eight Republican members of the California legislature support that legislation, some from very conservative districts. There is now a Noah's Ark caucus in Congress uh, uh, with reference to the biblical deluge, but also with reference to the fact that they come by twos. You can only join with one Democrat and one Republican. So lots of Republicans are now switching on this. And in the movie, there's the inspiring story of the city of Georgetown, Texas. I wanted to mention that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, Mayor Dale Ross is a conservative Republican, Trump-supporting mayor of the reddest city in the reddest county in Texas. He also happens to be a CPA. And he did the numbers and found that the citizens of his city could save a lot of money on their energy bills if he switched over to 100% renewable electricity. And they've done it now. Uh, And the bills are going down. The air is cleaner. And a side benefit is we can save the future of humanity. I love that part of the movie because... You know, so much now, I think everyone feels like they have to be 100% into something, and if someone else isn't, they're enemies. Yeah. People aren't talking. I'm not someone who believes that every Republican is a monster and every Democrat is awesome. Mm. I think there's jerks on both sides, and I think there's nice people on both sides. But at the core of it, we're all human. And to see you go down to Texas... Uh, and you know, and and talk, have a very civil conversation yeah. with someone who is politically opposed to many of the things that you believe in. Yeah, definitely didn't vote for you. Uh, you know, and just say, hey, you know what? We don't agree on a lot of things, but we do agree on this thing. Yeah. We're going to be civil to each other. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to work it out. That I think was one of the most inspiring parts of that movie, particularly with how people deal with each other today. So, how is it? Is it meeting in real life again, like you said before? Or how can we get rid of this idea that someone who doesn't fully agree with us across all platforms is our enemy, and we can actually understand each other as human beings? Yeah, well, we've got two big changes going for us uh, uh, in, in, in the effort to create this new political reality that, that you're hoping for. It, it is beginning to happen. There are a lot of Republican mayors and governors, by the way, uh, who are waking to the reality of the climate crisis and the availability of the solutions. The first big change in the decade since the first movie is that the climate-related extreme weather events are way more common and way more serious. Today, there are more than 100 fires burning uh, in the American West. Uh, Today, there are deluges uh, happening. The U.S. has had, uh, in the last seven years, 11 so-called once-in-a-thousand-year events. Every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. And even if the mainstream media does not connect the dots People are connecting the dots. Uh, Farmers, ranchers, uh, fishermen, others who work outdoors are saying to their neighbors, they may not use the phrase global warming, but they're saying, hey, this weather is getting uh, to be a very serious problem. And and it is. And I won't go into all the details, but that's waking people up. So that's in our favor, uh, unfortunately. Um, The second big change is that the solutions really are here now. The fact that uh, the electricity produced by solar and wind is following a pattern that we saw with computer chips and with mobile phones and flat screen TVs is amazing. And when the production scales up, the cost comes down even faster. There are contracts being signed now for electricity from solar at rates less than half what you can get uh, from electricity uh, uh, generated by burning fossil fuels on an unsubsidized basis. So, uh, and and it's continuing to come down. Batteries are now beginning to come down in cost very rapidly now Mm -hmm. too. Adding batteries to solar is a game changer. The whole energy system of the entire world is changing. And to put it in a broader context still, 
we are now in the early stages of a global sustainability revolution, which has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. And it's empowered by the new digital tools we have, not least the Internet of Things, which are giving people the ability to manage molecules and atoms in the same way that bits of information sure. uh, can be managed. Uh, new material sciences, uh, new designs. This is really transforming the world, decoupling GDP from energy use and emissions. Uh, and, and it's a very hopeful sign. So now we're still not solving this crisis fast enough. More damage is being done every day. We'll put a, another 110 million tons into the sky today uh, as if it's an open sewer. The cumulative amount of man-made global warming pollution now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding oh every 24 hours. 90% of it's going into the oceans, the heat energy, and so that is disrupting the water cycle. So we're getting these rain bombs punctuated by periods where droughts uh, occur quickly and go deeper and for longer. Um, we're seeing the timing of rainfall uh, change so that farmers are have their planting and harvesting disrupted in many areas. The heat stress, last year was the hottest year ever measured, second hottest the year before that, third hottest the year before that. I mean, it's pretty clear. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel said recently, the way you know global warming is real is if the hottest year ever is the year you're currently <laughs> in. Uh, and we, we've all been living through that. Uh, and And now that we do have the solutions, now that they are more affordable every day, the missing element is sufficient political will. But political will is a renewable resource, and we are now in the process of renewing it. And this climate movement is in the tradition of other great morally-based movements that have improved the lot of humanity. The abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, anti-apartheid in, in South Africa, mo most recently the gay rights movement. If somebody had told me five years ago that in the year 2017 gay, gay marriage will be legal in all 50 states, uh, and will be accepted, honored, and celebrated by two-thirds of the American people, I would have said, I sure hope so, but what are you smoking? That, that just doesn't seem very realistic to me. But it happened. As Nelson Mandela once said, it's always impossible until it's done. The climate movement is right at that tipping point now. What we need is for your listeners, uh, just to personalize it, to make this a priority, communicate that priority to others, develop a, a conviction and a passion to desire this change, uh, and, and then use your voice. Win the conversations on climate. The civil rights movement uh, passed new laws when the conversations were won. Use your votes. Use the techniques we talked about earlier in communicating with elected officials and candidates. Use your choices in life. When you go into the marketplace, when you insist on the most climate-friendly alternative, that not only reduces your own impact, more importantly, it also sends a powerful signal to business and industry that this demand is growing. The difference between profit and loss is often at the margin, and that's why you see all these companies now out there advertising we're greener than our competition. It's one of the reasons why companies like Apple and Google have shifted to 100% re renewable energy in, in this country and soon will be worldwide. Uh, so we're making progress, but we need more individuals to speak up to use uh, their, their, their voices, votes, and choices. Now, when you started politics, I feel like there was, and even when I was younger as well, finding information was difficult because there were, information was just difficult to track down. Yeah. You only got it from a handful of sources. Yeah. Now, we have the opposite problem where information is ubiquitous, but tracking yeah. down the truth is what's very difficult. Yeah. So whether or not people agree with some or any of what you're saying, how can you inspire them to just seek the truth? Just, you know, like how do you find the truth in a world where there's so many stratified layers of crap to sift through and most people you know won't put in the energy to look past a headline. They see a headline, they go, ah, oh, this is confirmation bias. That's I already believe that, so that's probably <laughs> true. Yeah. So how do you get them to find you know what's real if someone says well i don't know about this climate change thing i'm going to do some research how do you sift through all the crap to get to the i think that's one of the biggest challenges yeah. we have as a culture right now is finding what's real anymore yeah i think that's true but there's some trusted sources out there 
Wikipedia is pretty damn good. Uh, I mean, it's very effective. Uh, Snopes is good. I saw where they were asking for help from the public. I'm, I'm going to help them out. Uh, they're, they're a good source. They're, uh, skepticalscience.com. If you go to the climaterealityproject.org, uh, there, there, there are reliable sources of, of solid uh, information. But you're quite right that the information ecosystem that we now live in is very noisy, very busy, filled with distraction. Um, 8,000, uh, the average person sees 8,000 advertisements uh, e- e- every day. Oh um, I mean, impressions. Right, included. right, 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 right. Uh, and and uh, the line between entertainment and news has uh, eroded. The great, <laughs> the late great Neil Postman uh, wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Yeah, of death. course, yeah. Um, and, and so it is a legitimate problem. By the way, I think the, the noisy and cluttered information space is one reason why this is the golden age of documentary movies. Uh, and that's uh, why uh, there's been such a good reaction in the pre-screenings to this movie, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. When people sit in a communal setting um, and give 9,200 minutes, 94 minutes in this case, uh, to a very well-thought-out, well-constructed, a rigorously fact-checked presentation, it's kind of a unique opportunity to find what you're looking for. Um, but uh, you, you're, you're right that if you're just going on the Internet to try to figure out what's, uh, what's real and what's not, you have to develop your own list of sites that you trust. And, w- again, Wikipedia I recommend. Uh, w- <laughs> I, I have this idea that politics is maybe hopefully like – the West Wing, in a sense, where you can be on the and on not the, House of Cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean in the sense that you know you can be on the you know you could be on in the in the house arguing with someone. You know, oh, I believe I don't believe this, and what you're saying is yeah. full of crap. And you know, but then afterwards, you you know, you all go to the same bar. You're like, hey, is that pretty good out there? You know, hey, you know, I'm doing my thing. You know, it, it, is how much theatrics is involved, and how you know, like how how do you have access to actually just have real conversations because there there is a scene there's a scene in the movie where uh this uh, senator is asking you a question and then you start to respond and he cuts you off and you're like hey i just was trying to answer the question you yeah, just said yeah. i mean is there any is there any room for real conversation i really want to understand you know what the human elements of 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 this type of interaction is yeah most of my friends who are still in the house and senate uh, grieve the loss of some of that camaraderie that was more prevalent in, in the past. Uh, maybe it's coming back. I, I don't see it yet. But when I was in the House of Representatives, uh, there was a genuine camaraderie. And we could we had friendships uh, across the aisle that were genuine and, and real. <laughs> we, had a, uh, we had a basketball caucus. Uh, bipartisan, <laughs> and uh, I, I I don't know if it's safe to tell this story yet, but uh, we would we would have a, a game uh, almost every day when the Congress was in session, and we would leave uh, one Democrat and one Republican member of our basketball group on the floor to object to votes until the game was <laughs> over, <laughs> and, and then we'd uh, we'd we'd shower quickly and get the little trolley back to <laughs> just in time to vote, but. Um, one of the benefits of that kind of uh, camaraderie was uh, there were many times when uh, I and other members of that group had legislation, and I'd go to one of my buddies uh, that I was playing basketball with and and say, "Hey, look, you think you could help me?" I'll, oh yeah, what, what 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 what's the deal here? And I would explain it, and they'd ask a couple questions, and they say, "Yeah, yeah, I'll help you out." Uh, and have you talked to so and so? Yeah, well, no. Uh, will you help me with him? Yeah, and th- it used to work that way a, a lot. Um, and again, what changed that? I think it started with the d- the the pressure that came to raise uh, big sums of money. And now, a newly elected member of the Congress, their respective uh, party committee will get them on the first day and sit them down and say, look, we've done the calculations on what it's going to take for you to get reelected. You're going to need, uh, your district is so-and-so. You're going to need X million dollars over the next two years. 
uh, that means you're going to have to raise uh, X uh, amount every single day for the next two years. Uh, you're going to start today. Uh, we have a special room off uh, uh, out of the Capitol where you can sit down. Uh, we'll give you a computer-generated list of special interests and wealthy people and others who've supported your point of view. And you have to spend, on average, four to five hours every single day of your life begging these people for campaign contributions. Oh, wow. And so the time, I doubt the basketball caucus, well, I, I don't really know. I shouldn't say because I, I just don't know. Maybe they've revived it. But I do know that when you have to spend all that time on the telephone and going to these uh, cocktail parties with special interest to beg them for money, there's not much time left to 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 uh, to, to get to know your your colleagues across the aisle, much less develop really close friendships. I actually see some signs of it coming back in the Senate uh, a little bit. I hope I hope uh, what I'm seeing is real. Uh, and again, I put some hope in the onrushing uh, internet uh, media, which is making it possible for individuals to to uh, use their reasoning capacity and uh, find the best available evidence and convince people. Uh, there's also a scene in the movie where you're standing in my mother's uh, home city of Miami, Miami, uh-huh. Florida, where you're, you're, you're basically you're in, you're in almost like in knee high rubber boots and there's water flowing in because it's, you know, the water is overflowing because it's a high tide. It's a sunny day, but it's a, a high tide. And uh, by the way, I just want to commend you to not uh, that you fought the urge to stand in the middle of Florida after the 2000 election and go, see, this is what happens, Florida. <laughs> but honestly, uh, just as we're sort of wrapping this up. Because I think, you know, y- you've, you, you've overcome a lot and you're still working for, the, for people and you're still working for the environment. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to rehash stuff, but I'm just curious again on what the human side of this is. But <clears throat> because this is about overcoming odds for yeah. people who are overcoming anything. And so, you know, after the last election that you ran in, it's the day after – what do you do that next day after you concede? Are you looking at the ceiling all day? Are you angry? Are you like, well, I guess that's kind of a relief. Because I think you were able to spin that into something that was constructive and mm. positive mm. out of that. So what is, as a person, what do you feel at that next day? Is, do you feel <laughs> anything? Or is it just a, you're uh, just like, don't talk to me for a week. Well, you're giving me PTSD. Just I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, Winston Churchill famously once said of, uh, of uh, the American people, he said, they generally do the right thing after first exhausting every available alternative. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, it, it turns out uh, that there was no intermediate uh, step between a definitive Supreme Court decision and violent revolution. Uh, and <laughs> having <laughs> discarded the latter option, um, I decided to do the right thing. I exhausted every available alternative. But uh, more seriously, um, I have uh, felt lucky and privileged to find a way to serve the public interest uh, outside of the political system and uh, to continue uh, passionately advocating uh, for solutions to the most serious crisis we've ever faced. And and this movie, uh, An Inconvenient sequel truth to power did i mention the name of the I th- i'm not sure if you did so did which, i mention the website inconvenient sequel.com no i don't think so. i don't think it's can, come up at all yet alexa uh <laughs> if you, you can buy advanced tickets at inconvenient sequel.com and the hashtag be inconvenient i think i've got all the plugs i intended to get in but seriously um i have really in, uh, found a source of joy in pouring all my energy into this cause and it gives me energy back in return. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've put a lot into this uh, movie. The directors, uh, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenk, uh, have, in my biased view, uh, done a fantastic job. And I hope everybody will see it. What is a piece of advice as we're wrapping this up that you can give to people who feel like, you know, oh, I was on one path and, and there was a roadblock. But I'm not going to give up. Like, how do you, you know, like what keeps you going and what, what, would, what advice would you give to people to stay focused, be true to who they are, you know, find what it is that they, they want to do when roadblock after roadblock might come up? How do you, how do you push through? Well, just never give up. 
just just keep keep pushing and remember that all of these great causes have eventually won out there is a uh, a, a great line of uh, poetry from Wallace Stevens that I actually cite uh, in the movie. He said, after the final no comes a yes, and on that yes, the future world depends. We have seen that phenomenon happen uh, over and over again in, in human history. When the odds have seemed uh, impossible, uh, people who care passionately and who are basing their arguments on uh, the best available evidence and truth as they feel it deeply, do have the ability to eventually uh, overcome the distractions and the false uh, arguments that uh, are, are always uh, thrown up. If it's, if it's worthwhile, uh, you, you can win. Just keep going. Excellent. I thank you so much for your time. Well, it was really you. nice chatting with you. I've enjoyed it too. I've, thank I hope you, you have, and I, I hope you have. Uh, you know, I hope you have a great rest of the time promoting the film. Uh, hopefully, people will go see the movie. Just in case we didn't mention it, it is an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, and uh, and it's available. It's can you just is it available to purchase anytime soon? I know it's in limited. Yeah, release. no. The 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 website inconveniencesequel dot com is a place where you can buy advanced tickets in your city. It opens July 28th in New York and Los Angeles and in, and everywhere the following a week from Friday, August 4th, uh, all over the United States. And it's going to be shown uh, in countries all around the world uh, soon after that. Excellent. So we end the podcast by saying enjoy your burrito. It's how we tell our audience to enjoy their present. Enjoy the present as it's happening. Would you sign us off today, Mr. Gore? Just say enjoy your burrito. Enjoy your burrito. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. Who really pays the price for free porn? Find out in The Butterfly Effect with John Ronson, a former Nerdist podcast guest. Uh, in a gripping new original audio series available now from Audible. Uh, listen as best-selling writer of The Psychopath Test and frequent contributor to This American Life. Ronson leads you through a journey for answers in unexpected places and uncovers surprising consequences that popped up uh, when the world got what it wanted, seemingly free porn. Lives were mangled, fortunes were made, all for your pleasure. Uh, Listen to the stunning new audio series from Audible now at audible.com slash butterfly. A roadmap of your house, (laughs) you know, a floor plan of your house to uh, some of the other companies. And I'm thinking, wow, that would, if I had a Roomba, that would cause me to get rid of my (laughs) Roomba. I mean, seriously. I mean, by what right? I mean, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's so invasive now. Uh, And, uh, you know, you've had the experience, I'm sure some people have, of, using some word uh, in an email and all of a sudden you start getting ads for what oh yeah whatever that thing is well that's just that's just uh, i mean i could you know when that first started years ago it seemed benign but now when you when you add it to all of the other information i i, I just think that we need to <laughs> to to really be be careful on that stuff and have some restrictions on it and 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 by the way, I think it's really important to defend the principle of net neutrality. Also. I a hundred, of course, it is absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, the internet is, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say it's air, but it's 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 something that's so integral to the way that people yeah. need to exist now yeah. and to to tear it and to throttle certain people if they're not paying enough money is uh, is is rotten. I mean, and, and we are. It's almost like consumerism is 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 leading us, and we're welcoming this age of like techno fascism almost in a way where yeah. we're just allowing. And in some cases, you go, okay, I guess it's fine. You know, I I do like this one product, so when it gets offered to me, okay, great, I like that. But just the the farther reaching implications about becoming too reliant on this yeah. to exist is really is is kind of scary. And now now they have this uh, new development called ambient computing, which basically. You know, like Amazon's Echo, and there, right. there are others uh, where it's always listening, <laughs> yeah, and like you know you're supposed to trust the fact that it's only gonna, 
You saw the story about the kid who bought a doll on her parents' uh, yeah. Amazon, and the parents were furious, and it got into the uh, news, and a, a TV newscaster broadcast uh, the, the story and repeated the little girl's uh, command, uh, and hundreds of homes bought the same doll because, <laughs> yeah. because the, <laughs> the microphone picked up the order while the TV was on. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, it's a brave new world for sure. It is, and we really kind of have to figure out how to how to manage it responsibly, and, and especially, you know, it because I, I mean, I like that our culture has become a niche culture in the sense that the that the internet has really created a lot of communities that were very difficult to find in a pre-internet era. Everyone can find yeah. a community now, but of course, the downside to that is that the people are less willing to form laws, oh, okay. making change in government. Because you know, when you I I know when when anyone enters politics, I'm sure most people's agenda is I want to do good things. Yeah. Then you get into it, you find out it's not so easy to do exactly what you want yeah. when you want it. So what is something that you could share with people so that they could understand a little bit better how this process works so that they understand yeah. that it's not as simple as just do A and get B result? Yeah, it's uh, – of course, our Constitution was uh, constructed in reaction to the perceived abuses of uh, King George back in the day. Right. And so they made it uh, intentionally difficult to enact new laws. Uh, and uh, the kinds of laws that uh, inspired passions uh, uh, in the late 18th century, taxes in particular, uh, the initiative has to be taken by the House of Representatives, which is on a two-year re-election leash, mm -hmm. and therefore, in theory, much more responsive to the electorate. So... Um, uh, it, it, it's intended to be difficult. Now, here, here's the thing. You, as a citizen, have a, uh, a member of the House of Representatives uh, who uh, is responsive to you. You have two senators, where, whatever state you live in. Mm -hmm. You have a president that is the only one that represents the whole country. And let's just keep it at the federal level, but the same essential dynamics operate at this, in, for state government and for local government, city government, county government, et cetera, just at the federal level. Okay, so it is more difficult nowadays for you as an individual citizen to get your member of Congress to be responsive to you because <clears throat> they are more attuned now to the sources of their campaign contributions. Got it. Okay? So that's a, that's a problem. Sure. But it is not an insurmountable barrier. The old cliche, there's strength in numbers, still applies. And if you can go out on social media and collect a, a number of other people who agree with you, and then you can go to your member of Congress, you can knock on... The, the district office door. That person, the member of Congress, he, and she, he or she's probably not going to be there, but they'll have people who are, who are trained to, to recognize uh, passions <laughs> that start to, to of start to bubble up. If they have town hall meetings, you can go and, and take some other people with you. Go to the indivisible uh, organization. They've got this really down. They're, they're really good at that. Indivisibleguide.com, I think, is their, their site. Um, and, and so here is the young, boy, some of the personal attacks and some of the <laughs> <laughs> out, outrageous campaigns against individuals back then yeah, exceed anything in today's uh, politics. And, you know, there were people shot on the floor of the of Congress, course, oh, right. beaten senseless with canes. And, you know, it's... Uh, it. it uh, there was a senator. There was a blind senator from Oklahoma named Gore. Uh, he was actually the grandfather of Gore Vidal, and he, okay. he was a blind senator. I'll just tell you this quick story because it popped into my mind. He, uh, though he was blind, he was a, a very skillful orator. And the story goes that one of his uh, defeated opponents mumbled it on the Senate floor. If it were not for the senator's disability, I would challenge him to a contest of a different kind. 
To which Senator Gore replied, blindfold that son of a bitch and point him in my direction. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on now is uh, uh, a manifestation of human nature, which hasn't changed in two and a quarter centuries, at least. Do you think we're doing a do you think we are doing what the our forefathers, uh, the founding fathers would have thought we should be doing? Because sometimes I'll see like. You know, things are going on. I go, I don't know if that's what Jefferson had in mind. You know, like I'm not 100% sure that we are following, you know, what they what they hoped for our future. Do you think we're in line with what they saw? Or do you think, you know, we should really take a take a minute and reexamine? Oh, yeah, I think we should reexamine for sure. We we've strayed far from their design. But again, to put it in context, there have been other periods of the robber baron. Uh, era right. maybe maybe not quite as bad as now, but at least close. There have been other periods when uh, wealthy, powerful fat cats uh, were able to to pull the strings and punch the, and pull the levers and make things happen for them instead of for the public. Uh, and th- that part's not new. It's worse now, in in my opinion. And I think this in in, in the previous periods. They have been followed by waves of reform. Right. Uh, the, the populist movement that Teddy Roosevelt took and enacted all these reforms and antitrust laws and uh, all the rest, that was a healing uh, period for our country. Uh, and, and when the abuses have gotten out of hand, uh, they've, they've often been followed by reforms. We're overdue for a reform movement. But, you know, there's a law of physics that sometimes operates in politics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Of course. Uh, And the reaction to the excesses and absurdities of Donald Trump is quite impressive now. Uh, We're now seeing an upsurge of... I can talk to directors. I can talk to musicians. But it was... It was fun for me to sort of step outside a little bit and uh, and have a different kind of a conversation. And that's all these are, just conversations. Yeah. It's like what's human about this person yeah. and how do they how do they interact? And uh, and so uh, and and it was interesting to do it. We did it at the Four Seasons where the, his press junket was happening, and you could see downtown Los Angeles, and there was just like this <sighs> plume of I know. <laughs> this plume of gunk, just like a hovering, you know, that just cuts out the middle of the buildings. Terrible uh, smog haze all the time. I know. But then, you know, like I said in the podcast, like I'm, you know, I complain about that and I'm 100% part of the problem. I don't yeah. have an electric car. My house is not uh, solar powered. I mean, you know, I am I am part of the problem. So some of it was, you know, what can I do yeah. as a citizen who j- doesn't, you know, who says like, I want change. Well, I need to, I need to be a part of that change. I can't just complain and shake my fists. Like if I'm going to, if I'm going to bitch about stuff, I need to, what can I, what can people like me do if we're interested? Yeah. And he talks about that here and he talks about that in the movie. But it's also just so. about finding information. Like yes. no matter what you believe or no matter what you think you believe, just make sure that you're, you know, that you're sourcing information, you know, just like fi- s- seek out information. Yeah. Don't just read headlines. Yes. That's what I <laughs> um, but uh, yes, yeah, so this episode, Thou Gore, uh, also Stamps.com sponsoring the Nerdist podcast. They've been really sponsoring us for uh, forever. They've been such a great supporter so of this podcast. They really are. And so that is why we are loyal about telling you to not go to the post office anymore. You don't need to do it. Print and buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Sick, you click print and then you you mail it and you're done. It's so easy. It is easy. It's way easier than going to the post office, which closes traffic, having the park, getting out, and then and then everyone, no one seems to uh, like you know. I feel like every time I go to the post office, people are like, have never mailed anything. They've never before. been to a post office. Someone came up to April Richardson once. Like she said, this this teenage girl came up to her and was like, uh, "How do I mail a letter?" And April was like, "What?" Oh. She was like, do, "Do I put this in a put this yeah. somewhere?" And it was like, "You have to put a stamp on it, and then you have to put it in that blue box over there." So just stay at home where so, it's easier. And yeah, put just your own yeah, stamp. exactly. So just don't even don't even bother with all that stuff. <laughs> don't learn how the post office works. Just print stuff out in your home. Right now, you can enjoy Stamps.com with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That's Stamps.com. Enter the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Here's the NERDIST podcast number 889 with Al Gore. Katie, roll the thing. Now entering 
Nerdist.com. The digital revolution. And it's empowered by the new digital tools we have, not least the Internet of Things, which are giving people the ability to manage molecules and atoms in the same way that bits of information uh, can be managed. Uh, New material sciences, uh, new designs. This is really transforming the world, decoupling GDP from energy use and emissions. uh, and, And it's a very hopeful sign. So now we're still not solving this crisis fast enough. More damage is being done every day. We'll put another 110 million tons into the sky today uh, as if it's an open sewer. The cumulative amount of man-made global warming pollution now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. 90% of it's going into the oceans, the heat energy, and so that is disrupting the water cycle. So we're getting these rain bombs punctuated by periods where droughts uh, occur quickly and go deeper and for longer. Um, we're seeing the timing of rainfall uh, change so that farmers are have their planting and harvesting disrupted in many areas. The heat stress, last year was the hottest year ever measured, second hottest the year before that, third hottest the year before that. I mean, it's pretty clear. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel said recently, the way you know global warming is real is if the hottest year ever is the year you're currently (laughs) in. Uh, And we've all been living through that. Uh, And and now that we do have the solutions, now that they are more affordable every day, the missing element is sufficient political will. But political will is a renewable resource, and we are now in the process of renewing it. And this climate movement is in the tradition of other great morally-based movements that have improved the lot of humanity. The abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, anti-apartheid in in South Africa, most recently the gay rights movement. If somebody had told me five years ago that in the year 2017 gay gay marriage will be legal in all 50 states uh, and will be accepted, honored, and celebrated by two-thirds of the American people, I would have said... I sure hope so, but what are you smoking? That, that just doesn't seem very realistic to me. But it happened. As Nelson Mandela once said, it's always impossible until it's done. The climate movement is right at that tipping point now. What we need is for your listeners, uh, just to personalize it, to make this a priority, communicate that priority to others, develop a, a conviction and a passion to desire this change, uh, and, and then use your voice. Win the conversations on climate. The civil rights movement uh, passed new laws when the conversations were won. Use your votes. Use the techniques we talked about earlier in communicating to, to mobilize people who are, have really had it up to here with what Donald Trump and his rogue gallery of climate deniers are, are doing. Uh, and I, I'm optimistic that this may be the beginning of one of those reform periods. And so it, it, just for people who maybe don't understand the full scope of everything that's going on, so it, removing ourselves from the Paris Agreement, <clears throat> which is, you know, it, which is a large arc. I mean, it's, it actually doesn't come in until the end, but a large arc of the sequel is about the Paris Agreement yeah. in 2016. Um, so what uh, – does this mean that America is, is not – doing anything to reduce carbon emissions or is it is it now on each citizen to do their part to pick up where the government's not putting money into that anymore well it's uh everybody can make a difference for sure and you you start by learning about it uh I, i hope people will go see this movie because it will tell them what they need to know about the crisis about the solutions and about what they can do individually There is a book being published tomorrow uh, 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 with the same uh, title, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. It is partly a a guidebook for how you can be an activist. But it also, again, tells you everything you need to know about the problem and everything you need to know about the solutions. But it's not only down to individuals because we have a lot of governors and mayors and business leaders who are stepping up, filling the gap. They have said in large numbers, we are still in the Paris Agreement. Uh, We're going to meet the commitments made uh, by former President Obama, regardless of what 
Donald Trump does. California, I mentioned, just passed this historic legislation last week. Jerry Brown came from Sacramento for the red carpet premiere Tuesday night of the movie here in L.A. He's been a, a real hero. Um, and it's not only Democrats. He had eight Republican members of the California legislature support that legislation, some from very conservative districts. There is now a Noah's Ark caucus in Congress uh, uh, with reference to the biblical deluge, but also with reference to the fact that they come by twos. You can only join with one Democrat and one Republican. So lots of Republicans are now switching on this. And in the movie, there's the inspiring story of the city of Georgetown, Texas. I wanted to mention that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, Mayor Dale Ross is a conservative Republican, Trump-supporting mayor of the reddest city in the reddest county in Texas. He also happens to be a CPA, and he did the numbers and found that the citizens of his city could save a lot of money on their energy bills if he switched over to 100% renewable electricity, and they've done it now, mind. He, uh, though he was blind, he was a, a very skillful orator, and the story goes that one of his uh, defeated opponents mumbled it on the Senate floor. If it were not for the senator's disability, I would challenge him to a contest of a different kind, to which Senator Gore replied, blindfold that son of a bitch and point him in my direction. (laughs) (laughs) So what's going on now is uh, uh, a manifestation of human nature, which hasn't changed in two and a quarter centuries, at least. Do you think we're doing a... Do you think we are... Doing what the our forefathers, uh, the founding fathers, would have thought we should be doing. Because sometimes I'll see like, you know, things are going on. I go, I don't know if that's what Jefferson had in mind. You know, like I'm not 100 percent sure that we are following. You know, what they what they hoped for our future. Do you think we're in line with what they saw, or do you think you know we should really take a take a minute and re-examine? Oh, yeah, I think we should reexamine for sure. We, we've strayed far from their design. But again, to put it in context, there have been other periods, uh, the robber baron uh, era, right. maybe, maybe not quite as bad as now, but at least close. There have been other periods when uh, wealthy, powerful fat cats uh, were able to, to pull the strings and punch the, and pull the levers and make things happen for them instead of for the public. Uh, and th- that part's not new. It's worse now, in in my opinion, a- and I think this... In, in, in the previous periods, they have been followed by waves of reform. Right. Uh, the, the populist movement that Teddy Roosevelt took and enacted all these reforms and antitrust laws and uh, all the rest, that was a healing uh, period for our country. Uh, and, and when the abuses have gotten out of hand, uh, they've, they've often been followed by reforms. We're overdue for a reform movement. But, you know, there's a law of physics that sometimes operates in politics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Of course. Uh, and the reaction to the excesses and absurdities of Donald Trump is quite impressive now. Uh, we're now seeing a, an upsurge of progressive uh, activism on lots of issues, not least among them climate, that's really un- unprecedented. Uh, the indivisible movement I mentioned earlier is working with uh, the Climate Reality Project and uh, uh, Paramount uh, with and participant with the release of uh, this movie this weekend and o- over the next uh, few weeks uh, to, to, to mobilize people who are, have really had it up to here with what Donald Trump and his rogue gallery of climate deniers are, are doing. Uh, he, and now, you, you don't have a gatekeeper that you have to pay a ton of money no. to. Uh, and when people uh, connect with the thinking process of someone who's really taken time to collect information, process it, apply their values, and share it with others, that's the, that's the basic mechanism at the heart of the Constitution. And it's coming back now. And yes, the Internet has all these horrible problems and echo chambers and all the rest. But there's some self-correcting mechanisms, and we're beginning to see the evolution of it. The first decades of the printing press were pretty dang messy uh, also. And you saw in the Bernie Sanders campaign, whether you agreed with his agenda or not, just in terms of the fundamentals, 
he proved that it's now possible to run an effective campaign and potentially a winning campaign without having any special interest money, without having the lobbyists write the position papers, without relying uh, on big fat cat donors, but just going out on the internet and asking for small contributions from people who agree with the direction you're proposing. That's exciting to me. And it brings back that feeling that I had in the mid-70s when I was able to get elected to Congress without having a single uh, fundraiser, without relying on any special interest contributions. We can get back to the way American democracy is supposed to work. When you were incentivizing um, Internet growth early on, Mm -hmm. did it become... (laughs) <laughs> what you thought it would? Was it way beyond what you imagined? Or, you know, did you think, oh, this will just be some, you know, infor- it'll be like a, like a large public library where people just be able to freely share some information. I mean, did you have any inkling of how much it would become the matrix, essentially? Well, uh, a lot of what has developed was uh, something that could be anticipated. And I had the privilege of working with the scientists and engineers who were there in the earliest days and uh it it was possible to envision much of what uh, has unfolded but uh there have also been um developments that i did certainly did not anticipate and do not welcome we have a, a a stalker economy now where people are tracking your clicks and compiling uh I don't know if you want to call them dossiers, but they have huge compilations of information about everybody. And and before you even get to the intelligence services and security agencies, the uh, advertiser-supported Internet companies have an incentive to collect a lot of data about everybody. And I don't think that's very healthy. I I saw a story yesterday, uh, and this is maybe a tangent, but it illustrates the point. I see. Do you uh, ever, I mean, you must travel nonstop with what you're doing. I travel probably a little too much because I give my slideshow um, all around the country, all around the world. And I, I, I spend a lot of time training climate activists mm-hmm. and, and uh, that, that, that leads me to travel more than I should. Yeah. Right. I want to ask about, cause I don't, I don't want to talk about politics per se, but I'm interested in sort of the human side of politics because I think when we see, you know, what we see in the news, what we see in the headlines, or we see, you know, just footage of people in Congress sort of, you know, wagging fingers at each other, I think we think of it as very one dimensional mm. in, in terms of this, you know, I agree with this person, so that person is good and that person is bad. Yeah. But obviously there's a human element to it. Yeah. So, first of all, what made you want to go into politics because to me it just feels like it's so messy and how can you ever uncover what's true and how can you retain what you believe in while compromising with other people it just it just feels like such a disastrous mess (laughs) well um first of all my story is uh, a little uh atypical in that i was born into your father yes family my dad had been in the congress for 10 years (laughs) before i was born and uh, left the Senate, uh, was defeated in his last election because he was an early opponent of the Vietnam War in the Volunteer State, which right. is Tennessee's nickname. Uh, I was very proud of him. But I saw it all my life. And then in the mid-'70s, I was elected to the House. Uh, and I've watched it uh, from different points of view all my life. And in answer to your question, uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um I wanted to do what my dad did when I was a kid, but when I saw the presidency of Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War based on a lie at the talk, with the Tonkin Gulf uh, resolution, and then Nixon followed to that, and I just thought, man, that's the last thing I'll ever do. And I, became, I went to Vietnam, I came back, and I worked as a journalist for five years, and thought that's what I would be for the rest of my life. But I started covering government, and it kind of reawakened some of those uh, uh, young uh, childhood thoughts. Uh, uh, I began to think uh, that maybe I could do this a little bit better than some of the people I'm covering. And (laughs) Anyway, I jumped into a race for Congress. And the main point I want to make is that 
when I started doing these town hall meetings, I, I called them open meetings, uh, and then went back to uh, the Capitol in D.C., um, honest to goodness, it was so... Th- are going to call you horrible names. Yeah. And so, and especially now with social media, that's much more apparent than it, you know, it was even when you were vice president, you know, yep. you, you see more. But so, I mean, how, how do you, and I guess this is just good advice for anyone, but how do you stay on, uh, stay on point, take your emotion out of it and try not to personalize and just recognize like, well, you know, everyone's passionate, so maybe that's maybe that's just the way they express that passion in a very negative and broken way. How do you get around that? Yeah, well, there's. It's worth remembering uh, that it's a time-honored truth that uh, when someone or a group or some company uh, hates a particular message, they are tempted to lash out and attack the messenger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't take it personally. I've been uh, trying to. Catalyzed solutions to the climate crisis for 40 years now, and um, I've I've seen it. Uh, I've been there. I've experienced it. Uh, and yeah, you do get a thick skin just because it's human nature. When you go through this kind of thing, you you kind of develop uh, an an immunity of sorts. And uh, when when it, when it does get to you, you can easily pretend that it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> But that's it, basically. Well, yeah. I mean, if you believe in what you're doing, I mean, the whole thing is about uh, leg- authentic passion for, for what you believe in. And all of us have the ability to, to, to feel what's more likely to be true than not. Uh, and if you take time to gather the best available evidence and uh, engage in discourse with others to sort of refine your thinking about it, um, knowledge is power. Uh, and, and and then you're willing to to really put yourself out there and express it passionately and forcefully, then you you can really make 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 a difference. Yeah, but you know, to even survive a presidential campaign to me seems I don't even know how some you know, because people especially just pulling out everything and trying to spin everything as yeah. negatively against opponents as possible. And I you know I'm sure there are things that come out and you go well then, you know. Hey, I really wish I had time to explain this did not happen that way or yeah, this is yeah. not – you're lacking a context and that's a headline. But I guess you really have to figure out how to somehow just push all that out of the, out of the way. Yeah, and, it, and, and again, to put it in context, it, it's often uh, illuminating to go back and read about the – uh, presidential election of 1800 <laughs> or some of the some of the earliest uh, political contests when America was was young boy some of the personal attacks and some of the uh, <laughs> out, outrageous campaigns against individuals back then yeah, exceed anything in today's uh, politics and you know, the plugs I intended to get in but seriously um, I have really in, uh, found a source of joy in pouring all my energy into this cause, and it gives me energy back in return. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I've put a lot into this uh, movie. The directors, uh, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenk, uh, have, in my biased view, uh, done a fantastic job. And I hope everybody will see it. What is a piece of advice as we're wrapping this up that you can give to people who feel like? You know, oh, I was on one path and and there was a roadblock, but I'm not going to give up. Like, how do you, you know, like what keeps you going and what what would what advice would you give to people to stay focused, be true to who they are, you know, find what it is that they they want to do when roadblock after roadblock might come up? How do you how do you push through? Well, just never give up. Just just keep keep pushing, and remember that all of these great causes have eventually won out. There is a, uh, a, a great line of uh, poetry from Wallace Stevens that I actually cite uh, in the movie. He said, after the final no comes a yes, and on that yes, the future world depends. We have seen that phenomenon happen uh, over and over again in, in human history. When the odds have seemed uh, impossible, uh, people who care passionately and who are basing their arguments on uh, the best available evidence and truth as they feel it deeply, do have the ability to eventually uh, overcome the distractions and the false uh, arguments that 
are, are, are always uh, thrown up. If it's, if it's worthwhile, uh, you, you can win. Just keep going. Excellent. I Thank you so much for your time. Well, it was really you. nice chatting with you. I've enjoyed it, too. I hope you. you have, and I, I hope you have... Uh, you know, I hope you have a great rest of the time promoting the film. Uh, hopefully people will go see the movie. Just in case we didn't mention it, it is an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. And, uh, and it's available. It's, can you just, is it available to purchase anytime soon? I know it's in limited Yeah, release. no. The, the, the website, inconveniencesequel.com, is a place where you can buy advance tickets in your city. It opens July 28th in New York and Los Angeles and in and everywhere the following a week from Friday August 4th uh, all over the United States and it's going to be shown uh, in countries all around the world uh, soon after that. Excellent. So we end the podcast by saying enjoy your burrito it's how we tell our audience to enjoy their present enjoy the present as it's happening. Would you sign us off today Mr. Gore? Just say enjoy your burrito. Enjoy your burrito. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. Who really pays the price for free pull? To, to recognize uh, passions <laughs> that start to, to of start to bubble up. If they have town hall meetings, you can go and, and take some other people with you. Go to the Indivisible uh, organization. They've got this really down. They're, they're really good at that. IndivisibleGuide.com, I think, is their, their site. Um, and, and so here is the message you deliver. If you, for example, you want to solve the climate crisis, right? you deliver a two-part message. Part number one, I and all my friends want you to, to support solutions to the climate crisis. We're tired of uh, people uh, responding only to the carbon polluters. If you do the right thing, we are prepared to work for you and help you get reelected and campaign for you and, and tell our friends on our social networks that we're really for you. Part two of your message. If you are not on side, if you're for the carbon polluters instead of the public interest, I guarantee to you we will not rest until we defeat you and kick you out of office. So choose door number one or door number two. <laughs> now, if enough people deliver that message with passion and conviction and back it up with their physical presence at a town hall meeting or at a district office and handmade signs and really convince that person that you are deadly serious about this, you can clear the bar that makes them think, uh, hmm, maybe I can't go with the carbon polluters on this one. Maybe I'm going to get defeated if I do. It works. I've seen it work. Well, that's good to hear because I think that, you know, most people today are a part of uh, <laughs> hashtag activism where they just feel like, oh, I tweeted out a thing. I was angry in a moment and I tweeted out a thing and that was my political activism. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You got you, th that idea of, you know, showing up in real life is really, I think most people don't, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, there was a famous phrase, uh, weak ties, that uh, uh, describes the, the, the phenomenon you're talking about. If you just check a box on the Internet, if you just click, um, it, it's not meaningless. It, 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 it makes some difference, but not much of, of a difference. If, on the other hand, you, you actually show up in person, that, that does make a difference. And, you know, it's interesting that so many businesses now use this phrase, clicks and bricks, mm -hmm. where they will use the Internet to, to distribute information and get people into a store, or get people to a physical location, but then they're prepared for them when they show up in person. That uh, of the things that you believe in yeah. definitely didn't vote for you. Uh, you know, and just say, hey, you know what? We don't agree on a lot of things, but we do agree on this thing. We're yeah. going to be civil to each other. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to work it out. That, I think, was one of the most inspiring parts of that movie, particularly with how people deal with each other today. So how is it, is it meeting in real life again, like you said before? How can we get rid of this idea that someone who doesn't fully agree with us across all platforms is our enemy and we can actually understand each other as human beings? Yeah, well, we've got two big changes going for us uh, uh, in, in, in the effort to create this new political reality that, that you're hoping for. It, it is beginning to happen. There are a lot of Republican 
mayors and governors, by the way, uh, who are waking to the reality of the climate crisis and the availability of the solutions. The first big change in the decade since the first movie is that the climate-related extreme weather events are way more common and way more serious. Today, there are more than 100 fires burning uh, in the American West. Uh, today, there are deluges uh, happening. The U.S. has had, uh, in the last seven years, 11 so-called once-in-a-thousand-year events. Every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. And even if the mainstream media does not connect the dots, people are connecting the dots. Uh, farmers, ranchers, uh, fishermen, others who work outdoors are saying to their neighbors, they may not use the phrase global warming, but they're saying, hey, this weather is getting uh, to be a very serious problem. And, and it is. And I won't go into all the details, but that's waking people up. So that's in our favor. Uh, unfortunately. Um, the second big change is that the solutions really are here now. The fact that uh, the electricity produced by solar and wind is following a pattern that we saw with computer chips and with mobile phones and flat screen TVs is amazing. And when the production scales up, the cost comes down even faster. There are contracts being signed now for electricity from solar at rates less than half what you can get uh, from electricity uh, uh, generated by burning fossil fuels on an unsubsidized basis. So, uh, and, and it's continuing to come down. W batteries are now beginning to come down in cost very rapidly now mm -hmm. too. Adding batteries to solar is a game changer. The whole energy system of the entire world is changing. And to put it in a broader context still, we are now in the early stages of a global sustainability revolution, which has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. And it started years ago, it seemed benign, but now when you, when you add it to all of the other information, I, I, I just think that we need to, <laughs> to, to really be, be careful on that stuff and have some restrictions on it. And, and, and by the way, I think it's really important to defend the principle of net neutrality. I, a hundred, of course it is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, the Internet is, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't say it's air, but it's, it's, it's something that's so integral to the way that people yeah. need to exist now yeah. and to, to tier it and to throttle certain people if they're not paying enough money is, uh, is, is rotten. I mean, and, and we are... It's almost like consumerism is 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 leading us, and we're welcoming this age of like techno fascism almost in a way where yeah. we're just allowing, and in some cases you go okay I guess it's fine you know I I do like this one product so when it gets offered to me okay great I like that but just the the farther reaching implications about becoming too reliant on this yeah. to exist is really is is kind of scary and now now they have this uh, new development called ambient computing which basically. You know, like Amazon's Echo, and there, right. there are others uh, where it's always listening. <laughs> yeah, and, like you know, you're supposed to trust the fact that it's only going to. You saw the story about the kid who bought a doll on her parents' uh, yeah. Amazon, and the parents were furious, and it got into the uh, news, and a, a TV newscaster broadcast uh, the, the story and repeated the little girl's uh, command. Uh, and hundreds of homes bought the same doll because, <laughs> yeah. because the, <laughs> the microphone picked up the order while the TV was on. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, it's a brave new world for sure. It is, and we really kind of have to figure out how to how to manage it responsibly, and and especially, you know, it. Because I, I mean, I like that our culture has become a niche culture in the sense that the that the internet has really created a lot of communities that were very difficult to find in a pre-internet era. Everyone can find yeah. a community now, but of course, the downside to that is that the people are less willing to form larger, you know, communities for sort yeah. of a greater good. It's like, no, I have my tiny little community over here. I don't care what's going on over over there. Uh, by the way, um, assuming. Since your audience has grown so much that there are uh, a lot of homes with uh, these ambient microphones, yes. I I'd just like to say, Alexa, 
<laughs> go to inconveniencesequel.com. Nicely done. And buy advanced tickets uh, to an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power, which opens in Los Angeles and New York City on Friday. This movie, this weekend, and o- over the next uh, few weeks, uh, to 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 mobilize people who are, have really had it up to here with what Donald Trump and his rogue gallery of climate deniers are are doing. Uh, And I'm optimistic that this may be the beginning of one of those reform periods. And so just for people who maybe don't understand the full scope of everything that's going on, so removing ourselves from the Paris Agreement, which is, you know, which is a large arc. I mean, it's it actually doesn't come until the end, but a large arc of the sequel is about the Paris Agreement yeah. in 2016. Um, so what uh, does this mean that America is is not doing anything to reduce carbon emissions or is it is it now on each citizen to do their part to pick up where the government's not putting money into that anymore? Well, it's uh, everybody can make a difference for sure. And you start by learning about it. Uh, I, I hope people will go see this movie because it will tell them what they need to know about the crisis, about the solutions, and about what they can do individually. There is a book being published tomorrow uh, 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 with the same uh, title, in, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. It is partly a, a guidebook for how you can be an activist. But it also, again, tells you everything you need to know about the problem and everything you need to know about the solutions. But it's not only down to individuals, because we have a lot of governors and mayors and business leaders who are stepping up, filling the gap. They have said in large numbers, we are still in the Paris Agreement. Uh, We're going to meet the commitments made uh, by former President Obama, regardless of what Donald Trump does. California, I mentioned, just passed this historic legislation last week. Jerry Brown came from Sacramento for the red carpet premiere Tuesday night of the movie here in L.A. He's been a a real hero. Um, And it's not only Democrats. He had eight Republican members of the California legislature support that legislation, some from very conservative districts. There is now a Noah's Ark caucus in Congress uh, uh, with reference to the biblical deluge, but also with reference to the fact that they come by twos. You can only join with one Democrat and one Republican. So lots of Republicans are now switching on this. And in the movie, there's the inspiring story of the city of Georgetown, Texas. I wanted to mention that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, Mayor Dale Ross is a conservative Republican, Trump-supporting mayor of the reddest city in the reddest county in Texas. He also happens to be a CPA, and he did the numbers and found that the citizens of his city could save a lot of money on their energy